Well, hello, Ann. Shalom and welcome. Uh, it's great to see you all here. Uh, my name is Rabbi Andrew, and I'm the rabbi of Rosh Pina Messianic Congregation in downtown Toronto. And um, we're a community of Jewish and non-Jewish people who gather together to worship the God of Israel in spirit and in truth. And we uh, study the whole word of God as it is uh, presented in the Bible, fully centered on the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua. So we're glad that you're here with us. Welcome, everyone. We're going to begin. Tonight is a very special uh, teaching. We're going to continue our um, uh, teaching from last week, which is about the miraculous prophetic rebirth of the nation of Israel. And uh, we are going to connect to Israel. And by the way, as many of you know, today um, is uh, the day, it's called uh, Yom Ha'atzma'ut. It's the uh, Independence Day uh, of Israel as celebrated in Israel. Uh, it'll be coming to an end, I guess, already in Israel. But uh, yeah, we're just also coming to an end, I guess, here in Canada. But it was uh, today. So we are celebrating that. And as part of that, we're looking at the messianic uh, significance, the miraculous prophetic rebirth of the Yeshua. Uh, we just thank you, Lord, for bringing each person here. And uh, we thank you for this time. And uh, we just ask that as we study together your word and as it relates to the days that we're living in now and the regathering and rebirth of the nation of Israel, the Jewish people being brought to their um, uh, in the ancestral homeland, which you promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We just ask that you will bless this study together as we gather right now to look at your word. And we thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So um, once again, welcome, everybody. Um, we're going to continue. Now, last week we looked at um, some of the events that led up to the establishment of the state of Israel. We even went as far back as 1867 and looked at Mark Twain's visit, very famous visit to the land. And he, um, in so doing, he actually fulfilled a, a prophecy where it was said that a stranger, uh, this was Deuteronomy 29, 21, a stranger from a distant land would visit and would declare and note how desolate the land was and nothing can grow there. And that's exactly what Mark Twain did in 1867, which also happened to be a Jubilee year, uh, as, as we mentioned, and we talked about that. And um, I also referred you to, uh, because the person who's brought a lot of this out is our good friend, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. And he's written a book called The Oracle. And I totally recommend that it, that you you would pick that up and uh, so that was some of the stuff we just we talked about also the hebrew language being resurrected there was a prophecy about that from zephaniah 3 9 where god said i will restore a pure speech to his people so restoring means bringing back something that was lost and a pure speech, it's talking about basically the Hebrew language being restored to uh, as a living language. We talked about that. Um, and that was brought about by one man, in a sense, uh, and his family. His name was Eleazar ben Yehuda. And again, Eleazar is the Hebrew uh, name, which as we translate it, through Greek into English, it's Lazarus. So a man whose name is connected to the idea of resurrection literally revived Hebrew as a spoken modern language, okay? It already, uh, Hebrew never totally disappeared because it was used in synagogue and in liturgy. And there were pockets where there were some people, but as a as a modern thriving living language, it had it had disappeared. That had never happened before uh, in history. 
And so let's look at a few other things this evening. Uh, and again, if you want to, you can look at that video. It's posted um, on our YouTube uh, site. So you can see that. Now, I wanted to talk about a few other things tonight that are prophetic and again, not coincidental. As we say so often, uh, you know, the rabbis say that coincidence is not a kosher word. There is no such thing as coincidence. Uh, really, it's just an 11 letter word meaning God, <laughs> the hand of God moving in history. And so let's look at a few of these other things that have happened in fairly recent history. Now, uh, when people uh, talk about, uh, Jewish people talk about uh, returning to Israel, uh, to live in Israel from whatever country they might be in, whether it is uh, France, whether it is, uh, you know, Canada, United States, India, uh, where China even, if there are people returning to the land of their forefathers, they call that making Aliyah. You, I'm sure many are familiar with this. Aliyah is from the root, uh, uh, Hebrew root meaning to go up. Because when you're returning to Israel, you're, you're in a sense elevating, going up into the land of Israel. Uh, when you go to Jerusalem, for example, you have to go up. There's no way to get to Jerusalem other than going up. So that's also Aliyah in a sense. Uh, but what we would call, you know, immigrating to Israel is known as Aliyah. The people who make Aliyah, and this is from the same root, they're called Olim, ones who make Aliyah, those who are going up to the land of Israel. Now, who was the first Olim uh, in history? The first person to go to the land of Israel in a sense, was uh, Abraham, the patriarch, our father Abraham, Avinu, uh, Abraham Avinu, our father Abraham. And it's interesting mm -hmm. to note that, so he's the first person to go into the land because God told him to leave his uh, city and his family and his country and, and his household of his father and to go to the land, which I will show you. And this ends up being ultimately the land of Israel. So Abraham goes there. His name was Ab Avram at that time. And you know what's interesting? When was this person the first uh, uh, person to make Aliyah born? Well, he was born in 1948 B.C. <laughs> Amazing. 1948 B.C. Before Yeshua. Uh, 1,948 years. So that is amazing that he was the first um, Olea, the first person to go up to Israel, and he happened to be born in that year. Now, there's another connection to that year, which was discovered uh, some years ago by a, <coughs> a rabbi. And, the you know, so we know Israel was born in 1948, and... Uh, in our you know Roman calendar, if you will, uh, but that in in the Jewish calendar corresponds to the year five seven o eight. Okay, five seven o eight. Now, the five thousand seven hundred and eighth verse of the Torah, so corresponding to that Hebrew year, is Deuteronomy thirty verse five, and look what it says says this, Adonai, your God, will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, and you will possess it, and he will do good and multiply you more than your fathers. So that is another amazing thing, that the verse, the number verse in the Torah, which corresponds to the year of Israel's rebirth, actually talks about uh, the people coming back that Adonai, your God, will bring you into the land and plant you in the land and do good to you. So isn't that amazing? Again, not a coincidence. Um, all right. So those are a few things I wanted to share. Now we're going to look at a couple of other things um, as we get, as we move on. Another amazing thing and another amazing um, sort of 
again, non-coincidence, is that as, as we prepared for 1948, as, as uh, the world uh, moved towards that, in 1947, it was a very critical year also. But in that year, happened to be the year that the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. The Dead Sea Scrolls are, uh, as most of you know, um, ancient copies of the Hebrew Bible and other Hebrew writings. They were discovered in Qumran, which is near the Dead Sea. Uh, it is thought to be um, now, as uh, some believe, uh, you know, the, the thinking has changed on it, but it's now thought by some uh, to be actually a, a place where many priests had gone into the wilderness and many prophets actually, including even Jeremiah, as far back as Jeremiah, to set up a, a prophetic sort of school, a prophetic settlement or community. Um, and actually they sometimes referred to themselves, get this, they even referred to themselves as the way, the way, where have you heard that before? Interesting. Um, a person who's done an amazing amount of research into this and discovery that I, I recommend you to look into is, and um, hopefully he can join us one of these days. He's he's agreed to be willing to come and online and share, but his name is Jim Barfield. Okay, I'll just type it in here um, so you can look it up. Whoops, <laughs> one second. So Jim Barfield, okay, he is um, former, uh, he was a um, policeman, I think he's from Oklahoma, he's a very humble, nice man, uh, but he's been studying Qumran for many, many years, and just, I just, you know, encourage you look at some of what he said. He's he's done. Um, there's a book called the Copper Scroll Project. Uh, the Copper Scroll is exactly what it says. The name describes. It's a scroll made of copper, very unique, and basically every expert, no matter who they are, every archaeological expert in the world recognizes it's what we would now call a treasure map. It's a list of treasures from the temple and even from the tabernacle that um, it's saying where these things are and of course Jeremiah was linked to that so that's why Jim Barfield believes Jeremiah was involved in uh, that community there and there's other amazing connections uh, but basically you know we know that the temple was destroyed and at one point and uh, some of the items were hidden before that. We believe the Ark of the Covenant seems to have just disappeared. So uh, there are traditions and writings that tell us that Jeremiah hid it somewhere in that area, by the way. Um, and Second Maccabees 2 describes that. And But also um, the tabernacle in the wilderness that Moses uh, was given the instructions for and that they built in the wilderness um, according to the Bible, that was never captured or destroyed, ever. Um, the temple was destroyed twice on the same day in history, twice, amazingly. Um, the ninth of Av, twice. Uh, you know, but the the tabernacle, or the, the, as it's called in Hebrew, the Mishkan, was never captured or destroyed. So it's also believed that many of the articles of the tabernacle uh, were hidden by Jeremiah. They still exist somewhere hidden, and it's believed that it's somewhere near Qumran. Check out Jim Barfield. I just encourage you to do that. But um, the point of this is in 1947, those scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, were discovered. Almost every book of the Bible was represented there. Uh, the only one that wasn't really represented was Esther, but every other book of the Bible was represented there in either some kind of fragments of it, or there's a case, a wonderful case, that if you go to Israel to the scroll, uh, shrine of the book, it's called, in Jerusalem, there's a complete 
copy of the the scroll of Isaiah, Yeshayahu. It's there, and you can see it. Uh, it's an amazing thing. And so there were many scrolls. One of them was this copper scroll and others. Um, but um, the uh, many amazing things they found. But it's incredible that to think, going back to our topic for today, that <clears throat> when these things were discovered, they were discovered just the year before Israel was in the prophetic writings and all through the, the Hebrew scriptures, it is it is like the deed of the the land, if you will, deed of ownership, if you will, where it specifically says over and over again, God is giving this land to the Jewish people as an inheritance. Uh, he uses a, a couple of words in the Bible to describe it as an inheritance. And one of them is this word, uh, Morasha, uh, which actually means a perpetual inheritance. Um, even, you know, it, it's like a, uh, it's like even if they're not living there at the moment, it still belongs to them. It's forever, it's permanent, it belongs to them. And it's, this is God's word. So the fact that it was discovered just the year before. Now, you know, one of the interesting things is um, to contemplate is that the um, <clears throat> uh, many, you know, Islamic scholars and people <laughs> uh, said, well, the Jewish people and the Christians changed the Bible just to make it fit their purposes. For example, the ownership of the land. So, oh, the, the Jewish people tampered with it. Well, that was um, one thing that, and some, even to this day, Muslims would say. Uh, but the thing is, who discovered these scrolls? Well, it was a Bedouin shepherd boy. So it was actually not a Jewish person. It was an Arab Muslim boy who discovered them. Then it slowly became known and uh, all the world's archaeologists took place, uh, took part in the sort of um, this, the discovery and the unearthing of these scrolls and interpreting them. And so <clears throat> what we have is the, the word of God and we find that it hasn't been altered like at all. It hasn't been changed. It hasn't been altered. It's been passed down, transmitted uh, verbally and written down by scribes and that the same Bible that we have today is the same Hebrew scriptures that it was and this was you know more than 2,000 years ago so that just doesn't hold water the scriptures have not been changed and those scriptures declare that the land is God's land and that he's giving it to the descendants of Abraham Isaac and Jacob and it's as if the title deed, is, that's the word I was looking for, the title deed to the land was discovered to show to all the world just the year before the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Amazing. Okay, so that was very important. Now, uh, let's look at a couple of other things. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about also uh, was the first uh, prime minister of <clears throat> Of Israel, we we sort of made reference to him last week. Um, if you remember his name, everybody will know uh, David Ben Gurion. David Ben Gurion. <clears throat> he was actually born in Poland. Jewish uh, man grew up in in Poland, and originally his name uh, was David. And his last name was Grun, which is green. It's like Jewish, uh, Yiddish. You know, it sounds like German. Grun, it means green. David Green. But he also was a Zionist. He wanted to, and he believed that the Jewish people needed to return to their ancestral homeland and come back. We talked about that last week. That was one of the main themes of last week, how... Um, there was just this upsurge all over Europe uh, among the Jewish people, but also among Christians in Great Britain, United States, Germany, France, 
um, true Bible believing uh, Christians who all uh, all at the same time started having this um, sense that the Jewish people needed to return to their ancestral homeland. And uh, why is that? Well, that's what the word of God says will happen. Um, and so again, we just, we quoted one verse, Deuteronomy 35, where God says, I will bring you back. Okay. There's many, many, many passages that talk about that. David Grun, this young Jewish man, moves as a pioneer to the land and he uh, lives there and he decides, you know, as many of the people uh, decided now that we're going back to our land, uh, we also need to change our names to Hebrew names. Uh, last week I talked about Rabbi, um, sorry, not Rabbi, but Eliezer ben Yehuda, who he changed his name because he wanted a Jewish name, a uh, Hebrew name, sorry, because the Yiddish names were basically European. Like, as I said, Grun is like German. It's called, it's Yiddish, but it's really based on German. And so these names represented to them uh, the, in a sense, the diaspora or the uh, exile also. And now that we're going back to the land of Israel, we need a Hebrew name. That's what they felt. Not all Jews have done that, but that's what they felt, okay? So he thought he wanted to have a name that would be um, sound similar. Like often what they would do is, his name was Grun. So what would be a Hebrew equivalent, a Hebrew name that sounds like Grun, but is Hebrew? That's what they would do often. And so he searched and he found an interesting uh, name that sounded like Grun. And it was based on a famous um, person in the Talmud. This person uh, was a very wealthy um Pharisee. He was he was a well-known uh, teacher of Israel. He was wealthy. He lived in Jerusalem in the first century, and his name was Nakdimon ben Gurion. Well, that is amazing because that seems to be, from the best that we can tell, and you know, almost certainly, the person that we hear. In the New Covenant scriptures, in John 3, there's a Pharisee named Nicodemus. And in that's the Greek sort of spelling of it. But in the Aramaic, it would be Nakdimon. And it says he was a Pharisee, Nakdimon, a ruler of the Jewish people. In other words, he was very high position, part of the Sanhedrin. That's what it means. He was also... Uh, the Yeshua says you of Israel, you know, he, in other words, you're one of not only a ruler in the Sanhedrin, you're a teacher. So the fact that this man's name was a very a rare name, Nakdimon or Nicodemus really means that it was very likely this very same Nicodemus Ben Gurion because he existed at that time. Now, what's amazing about that is you just stop and think about it for a minute is what did Yeshua say to this uh, Nicodemus in, in Yohanan 3? He said, a person must be born again, born again. And then as history would have it, and I believe God sometimes has a sense of humor also, the first leader of the reborn nation is named after that person. That's incredible. I think most people don't even realize it, but I believe it is that same Nicodemus Ben Gurion, and then the first prime minister of the new state is Ben Gurion. And I think that is amazing because it shows us Israel is also like a prophetic, you know, it it's like a picture of um what we also as individuals must be like. We must be like the nation of Israel. We also as individuals must be born again, Yeshua taught. And Israel is a sign to the world. It was 
seemed to be gone. It seemed to be almost, in a sense, as a nation, a uh, state on earth dead for all intents and purposes. But yet, by faith, it lived on because the people continued to believe and have hope. That's why the national anthem of Israel is Hatikva, the hope, because it's it was never given up, that hope that one day the Jewish people would return. Every Passover, we would end with, and still to this day, next year in Jerusalem, because there was never uh, a doubt that one day we will go back. And so Israel was born again. The language was resurrected by a man named Lazarus, in a sense, Eleazar. And the first prime minister was a man named after Nicodemus Ben Gurion. Incredible. Incredible. Now, I want to look at a couple of other scriptures briefly tonight. Um, and then we're going to close a little bit earlier than usual. Um, so, also, uh, let's look at um, in Hosea chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. I also wanted to mention, I talked about this a little bit on Shabbat, because we have entered into the, um, the month of Iyar, which is the first month after Passover, the first new month after Passover, and it's amazing also that when we think about it, uh, the nation of Israel, when they were first born, the first time, they came out of Egypt, out of slavery in the month of Nisan. And then their first new month in as a nation being born out of Egypt. You know, God said, out of Egypt, I've called my son. Now it refers to Israel and it refers to the Messiah, Yeshua. We must always remember that there is an inseparable link between the nation and the king. You never separate the nation and the king. So that scripture applied to both Israel. Out of Egypt, I called my son, but also out of Egypt, I called my son, referred also to the Messiah, Yeshua, the king of Israel. But let's look at, at so this prophecy, uh, Hosea 3 verses four and five, uh, it says, this is Hosea three, verse four and five, for B'nai Israel will remain for many days without king, without prince, without sacrifice, without sacred pillar, and without ephod or teraphim. That means they will, they'll not have a king, they'll not have a government, they'll not have a temple for many days. Verse five, afterwards, B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, uh, will return and they will seek Adonai, their God, and David, their king. Then they will turn in awe to Adonai and to his goodness in the last days. Uh, so this is talking about a spiritual revival which will take place when the children of Israel... Um, are in their land, but without a temple, without uh, a king, but yet they're back in their land, so God will bring them back, but then a spiritual revival will also come later, and that's where what we're, we're believing will happen very soon. And that is a pattern in uh, prophecy that we see over and over again. In I just want to read another one. Um, in Ezekiel 36. Uh, here's another great one, by the way, just before I get to this, the next one. But in Ezekiel 36, verse 8, it also says, uh, But you, mountains of Israel, you will shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit for my people Israel, for their return is near. And you know, um, it's amazing. Remember, Mark Twain said in the 1860s, 1867, it was completely desolate. Uh, the land was completely desolate, just as God had said it would be, right? God had said it would be in Leviticus 26, as early as that. He said it'll lay desolate until his people return. And you know what's amazing? Many empires came and went, 
the Romans, the Greeks, the Persians, uh, the Arabs, the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, and yet the land remained desolate. It was only when the Jewish people returned that the desert began to blossom. And now, in fact, in Israel, you have uh, vineyards again on the mountains of Judea and Samaria. And uh, just the desert is blossoming once again, but only when the Jewish people return. And uh, so that's another prophecy that is fulfilled the people of Israel, the Jewish people began to return to Israel and began to work the land even before the nation was born in complete fulfillment of Ezekiel 36, 8. They began to farm. They began to have vineyards. They began to have uh, olive uh, groves. Uh, and as a matter of fact, this is just something to note um, for uh, clarity. Um, the, so the land was desolate. Now there were some, uh, there were, there were Arab, uh, residents in the land as well as there were always Jewish residents in the land. In fact, some, uh, uh, by some accounts in the 1800s, Jerusalem was more than half Jewish. Okay. So the idea that it somehow was never, uh, that the Jewish people came in and took it over is totally false. That's a false narrative. But um, the there were some uh, Arab residents, not uh, not so many, but there were definitely some. Some of them were Christian, and it's actually believed that many of those Christian Arabs, like for example in Nazareth and and Bethlehem and so on, probably were many of them, not all, but many of them could have been, uh, some definitely were, the early Jewish believers in Yeshua. So they became believers in Yeshua, and then later the Arab conquest came in. They began speaking Arabic, but they were always there. Some of them, by the way, speak Aramaic, so they have a connection way, way back. They could actually be partly descendants of the early Jewish believers who never left the land. Okay, there are accounts, early accounts of the family of Yeshua. Now, just imagine this, you know, Yeshua, real man. He was the son of God, but he was a real man. He grew up in Netzeret in, in Galilee. He had relatives in that area. Um, he, we were told he had brothers and sisters and so on, and uh, definitely aunts and uncles, all kinds of things, extended family, that there were visitors who would visit that Galilee region 200 years later and you could still visit the family of Yeshua. They were still there. Um, and some even visited and saw some of the items that Yeshua and his, you know, and Joseph made in their carpentry business. And these items still were there. And they said they were really well-made, high quality and incredible. So hundreds of years. And there's some even today who, claim that they're still descendant of that uh, family. But the thing is, um, they never left. And um, the so what happened when the Jewish people started to come back from Europe into the land and to create agriculture and, and farms and vineyards, here's what happened, which I think you need to know. Many... Uh, workers from the migrant workers from the surrounding area, meaning Lebanon, Syria, uh, uh, Egypt, and uh, Iraq, even as far as Iraq, Arab uh, Muslim people came. Uh, they could have been Christian too. And I've talked to some of them and they admit it. They say they came to, uh, to Israel. So they weren't living there for hundreds of years. They came there. Why? to work for the Jewish businesses and agriculture that had been developed by the Jewish pioneers. So some of the people, ironically, who are claiming the Jews stole their land, which is a totally false because they uh, not only bought the land, sometimes bought it twice, so legally bought it and purchased it, but then through international law, they actually, the land has been given to them. That's final. But 
some of the people who are now claiming they stole our land came from other countries to work for the Jewish people. And that's a fact. Many of them, many, many, many of them, like one of the most, well, let's just leave it there. Okay. That's enough said these, this is documented. Okay. Documented that there never were in some areas, there was nothing Mark Twain, describe it desolate desert nothing until the jewish people came back started to create agriculture and then people came seeking jobs to work there and then they come and say um after 1948 hey you're stealing our land <laughs> so this is the reality that i think we all need to look into and be aware of because there's a lot of fake news ladies and gentlemen it's not something new it's been around for a long time. Um, so that is really something critical to understand. Um, now, going back to Ezekiel 36, um, the there's another chapter, uh, there's another verse here in Ezekiel 36, 24, where uh, this is the Lord speaking through Ezekiel. He says, Ezekiel 36, 24, for I will take you from the nations, gather you out of all the countries and bring you back to your own land. This is clearly talking about uh, what we see in modern times. People, Jewish people, people of Israel coming from all the countries back to their own land. Uh, there were there are Jewish people coming from China, Jewish people coming from India, Jewish people coming from France, North America, Africa, South America, all the countries coming back to their own land. And then it says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the stony heart from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my ruach within you. So now what we see is this pattern again of the physical return of the people to Israel. First, they will come back physically. Then there will be a spiritual revival that will follow that. And again, we are beginning to see this and we're going to see a complete amazing massive spiritual revival happen in Israel one day and it's coming soon so that is just a pattern that we see there <clears throat> now I also wanted to mention by the way um, this also just last weekend was the 100th anniversary of something very important was called the San Remo um, conference. Before there was a United Nations, there was something called the League of Nations after World War I. <clears throat> and so at the San Remo conference, which took place in San Remo, uh, Italy in 1920 in April, okay, so just this past week, a hundred years ago, they had a conference and they made into uh, into international law. You see, that was the governing sort of body that would decide international law. And they ratified into law uh, something that was called the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration was uh, after the British... Uh, defeated the Ottoman Turks and kicked them out of the province of Palestine, they declared through their foreign minister, Lord Balfour, that the British government uh, would look favorably upon establishing a Jewish homeland for, you know, for the Jewish people, a Jewish land in what was called again the province of Palestine. So they said, we want to make a homeland for the Jewish people. Why is that? Because so many of the uh, British uh, Christians at that time were actually basically Christian Zionists, um, in a sense. Not all, but there were many. Um, and so 
they wanted to create a Jewish homeland in what was called Palestine, but it was later to be Israel. What's interesting to note, if you look at a map, and if you look at Israel, and then look at the entire nation of Jordan, Jordan, okay, it's a huge area, okay, much bigger than Israel. That was Palestine. And that's what they said they would give to the Jewish people, that entire area. <laughs> um, and, and in San Remo, a few years later, in 1920, 100 years ago, the governments of the world, the League of Nations, which was the uh, appropriate governing authority to put this into international law, ratified that declaration and said yes, and they created something called the British Mandate. What is a mandate? It means you are mandated to do something. What was the mandate? Carry that out. Create a homeland for the Jewish people. That was their mandate they, in, in that area. Um, now, sadly, slowly, the British government, there were many changes that took place, and they reneged on their mandate. They were supposed to give that entire area, including Jordan, to the Jewish people. Well, they what happened was the um, there was a family known as the Hashemite, uh, royal family now they're called the kings uh, the king of uh, jordan is the hashemite royal family in jordan but guess what they're not from jordan they were kicked out of saudi arabia what's called saudi arabia by the uh, the house of saud which is now the royal family in arabia but previously the hashemites were there they were kicked out and the british wanted to um sort of uh, give them a token or something. So they decided to give them the whole area uh, called Transjordan. Now it's called Jordan. They had promised to give it to the Jewish people. Now they said, we'll give it to this exiled family from Arabia. Okay, huge area. So now it was cut down to just everything on the west side of the Jordan River would be for the Jewish people. Well, again, that was reneged on and so on. But why is this important? It's important because sometimes you hear, and this is very important, folks, to get this, all of you, and even, you know, you're hearing, for me, Just I'm just scratching the surface, do some research into it yourselves. Uh, there's many books about this um, that you can find, but we're talking about history, we're talking about facts, we're talking about we're not talking about fake news. We're talking about facts, okay? It's amazing to me how people sometimes today, you can share facts with them and they get angry sometimes and they they don't want to hear the facts. So, you know, I remember the, um, you guys probably remember this too, that movie, very uh, famous uh, movie, Tom Cruise was in it and... Uh, Jack Nicholson, and there's a scene where they're in a courtroom. Uh, Tom Cruise is a lawyer. Jack Nicholson is a military commander. Um, the name of the movie escapes me. I'll remember it later. But in the courtroom scene, uh, you know, you know, Tom Cruise says, I want the truth. And Jack Nicholson just, you know, lashes back at him and says, you can't handle the truth, you know. You know, there's a lot of people who it's almost like they can't handle the truth when you talk about certain issues they just they don't want to hear about it. but look one of the things here's what i'm getting to you hear it all the time in the news media okay like the mainstream media okay all across the news and here's what i want to say to you ladies and gentlemen you know what yeah a few good men thank you steven yeah it's a good movie. I'll, I'll recommend it. There's a bit of language. It's nothing new. It's been around. There's been fake news forever. We need a lot of discernment, and we need to do our homework. But here's why I feel the mainstream media. Here's just one example. You see, they're constantly, all the time, talking about the occupied territories. All the time. They refer, even now, it's becoming an issue because 
you see, this is where our study connects to current events because uh, the government in Israel is talking about annexing part of Judea and Samaria. Well, let's see, Judea, what does that mean? It means land of the Jews. <laughs> so, gee, I guess it must have that name for a reason. Yeah, it's because it's the Jewish homeland. And Samaria is also the biblical homeland of the Jewish people. Elijah, Elisha, they ministered in Samaria and so on and so forth. These are the ancestral lands of the Jewish people. Okay. But in the mainstream media, we call, hear it called the occupied territories. The occupied territories. Well, what I'm saying is 100 years ago in San Remo, Italy, the international governing body that was responsible for putting things into, into law decided rightly that the land which is making up all of Israel, all of biblical Israel, including everything west of the Jordan in particular, would be a homeland for the Jewish people. So guess what? What, who is occupying the land? It's not the Jewish people, they're not occupying the land. It's if what it would be called properly under international law, it's not occupied territory, it's contested territory. There's two people claiming it. That's reality. But really, it, the bottom line is there's already been a few wars fought, which Israel won. And they not only have a biblical claim, Dead Sea Scrolls, again, 1947, were unearthed to show to the world. Here's the title deed, according to the word of God, this land belongs to the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some people say, well, aren't the Arabs descended of Abraham? Well, uh, according to the Quran, they are. Uh, the Bible doesn't say that, actually, but whatever. But the even if that's true, which, okay, let's accept that, but it clearly, in the, who becomes Israel and the 12 tribes, it's a covenant that goes on that God, it's eternal. It will never change. Uh, and so the land still belongs. But here's the thing. Now we have the nations of the world uh, sort of, they, they can't handle the truth. And they're going against this Abrahamic covenant in many ways. And part of it, a big part of it is the land issue. I'm going to recommend two books to you. Two books to you. This is... Um, this one, Understanding the Arab-Israeli Conflict. Understanding the Arab-Israeli Conflict by Dr. Michael Rydelnik. The subtitle, What the Headlines Haven't Told You. And so that's a great book, and it goes into describing a lot of the background of what I'm talking about. And here's another one, really good, Alan Dershowitz. He's a Law professor, as you know, many of you know, Harvard, Harvard University, the case for Israel. He goes through point by point all of the objections against Israel um, having their land and etc. And he just goes through all the arguments. And it's a really methodically well done book. So I'm just saying, do your own homework on this and dig deeper. But I'm saying this right now is that. <laughs> when they say in the mainstream media, occupied territories, it is false. It is false. They're not occupied. Okay, they're occupied in the sense that there's Jews living there and there's Arabs living there and there's a dispute. But really the, you know, the, the covenantal title deed is found here in the Bible. We know that. Uh, but also... Because, you know, many people who would be against this, uh, that you would come into contact, they don't care what the Bible says anyway, because they're into a lot of stuff that the Bible's against, uh, for example, or the Bible's for, they're against. Okay, so you could say that, you know, well, the Bible says it. they don't care. Okay, so we do care, we care, and we know that this is the truth. 
and we know that the land belongs to the people of Israel, etc. But I'm just saying you can use it, but some people in an argument, well, they just don't really care. But so let's go to international law then if you, you want to do that. These areas uh, where it's called the occupied territory, that is not true. It's false. These are at best contested territories. But even then, um, the, the uh, argument uh, for Israel uh, to have their land there is better, stronger. Uh, because again, many of the people who came there to, to now say it's their territory came in from the neighboring countries to work for Jewish settlers. So, you know... So anyway, let's um, let's close it off there tonight. Um, I think it's very important to study this. I think it's very important to know uh, all about these things. I think it's um, because this is an ongoing issue. But, you know, praise the Lord, Israel has been reborn as a nation according to what God said. We can see, as we talked about it briefly tonight, how there's so many connections of what was going on in history to make this happen, that they're, they're not coincidences. And there's many more we could have talked. We just talked about a few tonight, but there's many, many more. And so we also can see that, uh, you know what? The... Um, <laughs> The other thing that we can see is that uh, the word of God is true and that the, therefore, you know, we have to start realizing if, you know, someone's listening who's not a believer to start reconsidering your worldview, to start saying, hey, wait a minute. Maybe the mainstream news isn't always true. Maybe what I've been told in school, you see, some of the things that you trust, you would trust your school, you trust your teachers, and I'm not against them. You know what I'm saying? I'm not against that. But what I'm saying is, what are they being taught? They're being taught this is occupied territory. That's false. So we need to look at the truth. We need to look at the facts on the ground and be educated in that. Um, another thing I just want to say briefly, it's not really connected to this topic, but I think it's also important, uh, just as I was talking about what, what we're educated with, let me tell you, the beginning in kindergarten, people are taught that, <laughs> um, that, you know, evolution is the only theory that we can believe in. They're taught beginning in kindergarten that um, the world was just developed just randomly, you know, over billions of years, and that uh, ultimately it's just chance. And, uh, and basically what that does is that attacks the first verse of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so there's an attack against the creation. There's an attack against the creator. There's an attack against the word of God. And it's in the school system. We need to be educated that, you know what? That's not true, actually. The whole theory of evolution's actually been proven to be false. And yet they keep pushing it out there. And there's no other alternative. Like, hey, maybe there's a creator. Maybe there's an intelligent design. And also, you need to look into that and be educated into it to be able to give an answer because once you can break through and show someone that, that, that they've been believing a lie, that can open the reality to, wait a minute, the word of God is true. And that can open the door to then realizing everything the word of God is, says is true, that there's such a thing as sin that there's such a thing as um, salvation, that there's a Messiah, that Yeshua came, and that we need to believe in him. And so I'm just putting that out there as well. 
to begin, it's the same thing. Begin to know the facts so that we can connect with people and show them the truth. The same creator who created the world, and we can see it all over, uh, all over the world, his, his handiwork, and in the heavens. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. That same creator God also gave the land of Israel to the nation, the people of Israel. And we can see throughout history that he is carrying out his purposes no matter what anybody says. He is sovereign. And you can actually, if you really look at it, realize that he is God. He is on the throne. His word is the truth. And we need to share that in a respectful way, but we need to be strong, we need to be bold, and we need to have our, our, our facts as well. So yes, happy 72 birthday to Israel. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us and join us uh, this Saturday at 10.30 a.m. I just wanna say one thing. Sometimes if I send the notice late or I don't send it, it doesn't matter. We will be